I mean, you have please. a big gun, you are not the big gun. Tony, don't be oh. jealous. No, it's subtle, all the bells and whistles. Yeah, it's called being a badass. <laughs> This particular sequence that I'm going to show you is one that was uh, kind of uh, put in at the very end and had additional stuff that uh, we hadn't really anticipated needing to do. And, you know, when it was initially designed, we were going to be actually setting back uh, uh, the whole event was going to take on top, take place on top of this tower uh, back here in the back. Um, we, we had roughly 35 shots, I believe, that this had to be uh, kind of spread out amongst. Uh, some of them were a wider shot like this. Uh, some were very long lens, very in tight, very intimate moments uh, where you would see even less of the back, basically background. Uh, you know, and, and of course, you know, along with that, what we need to do is set up some form of kind of continuity between the shots. Uh, nothing worse than cutting from one shot to the next shot and then suddenly realizing, well, that, you know, fires in the wrong position or a different position than it was before. Um, so, uh, what we came up with was an approach that was different than an approach we used earlier in the movie where we actually made a, like a, a 360 degree panorama psych that would allow us to move the digital camera anywhere we wanted to within that environment. Uh, the feeling hits here is since we were pretty much kind of in the same angle and it was just either pushing in or looking a little left or looking a little right, we didn't really need to go to the route of, of building a full 3D environment that we could move around in. Now. Uh, for this background, uh, like I said, you know, uh, a little interesting story about this is that, you know, as I mentioned, they, they were shot on top of a metallic roof to match this here, so uh, we were unable, of course, to just extract them out. We actually came back in and did the rotoscoping to isolate them out from the plate. We actually had to do a little bit more of, of relighting because uh, since they were initially going to be up here, there was more firelight hitting them, and there was a bank of lights right along kind of the, their ankle level as well that was illuminating them. So we had to try to relight the blue screen a little bit to that. And actually, you know, that lighting in the, the blue screen actually is what driv, uh, was a driving force about how we would put together the background. You know, we purposely tried to put flame to the left, flame to the right, so that we had justify this light source. So is it accurate? Probably not. I mean, you probably would not get that much exposure on the left and right side of the faces. but by creating a background that kind of simulates that you're able to cheat it in and it takes the curse off of that blue screen feel which is always something that we're trying to do now you know a lot of times what we do uh, for this texture we had to find a roof texture we actually went out and, and with a still camera shot a a rooftop texture uh, that we then brought into the composite and you know color timed it back into the background uh, we also came along, it felt a little boring there, needed stuff, so we added trash up there. Uh, and then we actually uh, put a little bit of a, a, a water reflection in there just to give a little bit more interest to it. So this is one of the backgrounds that we shot. They shot it, of course, uh, about dusk. Uh, you know, since it is a night shot, they were uh, decided to go this route instead of a day for night because we would get a lot of car lights on. And, uh, you know, it was kind of done around, I guess, rush hour and would give a lot of movement to the plate, give it a lot of life. Now, the danger with doing something like that is, you know, you have to do a plate stitch. And, uh, you know, for a still frame, plate stitching are just, you know, day in, day out, you do them all the time. It's not a big issue anymore. Uh, but, you know, for us, we actually had to take it in and we, we had our layout artist uh, create us a layout camera and we ran it in through the Nuke nodes here that allows us to do that. So we would end up with an image as this builds up here that was uh, essentially, you know, a pretty wide resolution. Uh, we then had to calculate, well, how much of this are we going to actually need to use? And so by they're again taking a rough version like this. We, we took it into uh, the layout and determined where we were going to be for the specific angles and found out that, you know, the, the most we would see might be over here 
and then same way over here uh, as far as this area. So we ended up coming up kind of with a crop that we could would utilize in this area here. Uh, it was a little bit of guessing and uh, you know trial and error, but we we came up uh, ultimately with a format that we ended up using that we called 8K ish. <laughs> It wasn't quite a, a, an official 8K resolution, but it was somewhere in that. And essentially, we were taking that 8K one-to-one -one pixel crop out of something that I think was closer to uh, maybe 12 to 15K as far as the overall width. So this actually is how our layout camera came about uh, after we calculated this out and figured the distance from the camera to the actual expo back there. We ended up getting you know, this uh, projection that we would put on the three planes. Now, once we got this done, of course, there are some scenes that you have to deal with. Uh, if you notice down in this area specifically, you get into issues with traffic uh, because traffic's moving. And uh, since this was not shot with a, a specific camera array that would capture all of it at one time, this was kind of the poor man's version. Camera here, you run it for a few frames. Camera here, you run it for a few frames and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, we ended up with, with definite seams that we had to deal with. Now, there's a, a couple approaches you can do to that, and for us, um, we, we ended up picking kind of some critical areas where we could hide it. Uh, this one you can't see it yet, but one of the final comps, it's like sometimes you, you find out you got a bridge line or a break here. You know, this is an ideal place to put a break in. Uh, we, we talked about if it got really bad, we were actually going to put actually an, a, an additional bridge in there or some type of geometry that would hide it. You know, if you do watch this and really look close, I mean, there's only, I think, one or two shots were really wide enough to see the traffic. And at that point in time, there's a camera move on it. So you really don't detect it. Uh, I mean, if you're looking really hard for it uh, and you're really astute, you probably can see it once, you know, we point things out but there's definitely speed differences, like the traffic coming in here on the right-hand side moves a lot faster than the left. Now, um, once we had that background done, we sent this over to our Digimat department. And uh, they came out uh, with a, a map painting to work with. Now, unfortunately for us, we don't have the correct look up on this, so it's going to look a little uh, different than, than what the, the final uh, composite was. But, uh, you know, the Digimat artist went in here and did an incredible job on all of this, uh, building all of the environment and, uh, you know, stealing, uh, when I say steal, it's, you know, borrowing real footage uh, from, from plants and, and uh, that we either had in our element database or actually uh, he tended to go out and do a lot of shooting. In fact, uh, as I point out back here, this, this uh, back hillside is actually the Oakland Hills as seen from San Francisco. Now, um, and why do we do that? Of course, you know, anytime you can get realism, start out with a plate that is real, you really should use that because that gives you uh, the opportunity to, to, one thing, do a lot less work. Uh, and it also gives you a good reference guide as far as what you need to guide towards. I mean, you see how kind of diffused and blown out some of this type of stuff is here. Uh, you know, that's a good indication of, of where we're going to have to go with this ultimately. Uh, which is what the plan was. Uh, you know, we, we have our Kodak signs, uh, the Digimat artist, he, he added animation to all of this stuff, and he's got twinkling lights and, and uh, you know, all of these uh, neon displays and, and just incredible work they did. Um, you know, with all of that said, still when it comes down to the final putting it into the plate and composite, that takes a whole, whole lot of time too. And, and the feeling is, you know, it's like, why waste, you know, the talent of the Digimat artists dealing with that when a compositor can come in and, you know, finish it off while they go on to do another shot. Um, you know, I'll back up a little bit and kind of let you see how we approach uh, the comp on this. We, we tend to, to go with a little bit more of a vertical kind of compositing uh, approach. Uh, I know there's a lot of different techniques and a lot of different ways people do it. But by doing this, you know, you can slice a whole area of the comp and let's just say that, that they've determined that, uh, you know, we, you know, this is already spread out, but you need to plug in a new element right in here. You can actually select that and, and move it up and suddenly you've, you've left yourself this big open space to put stuff in. And it's pretty easy uh, for someone to come along if necessary uh, uh, that you need uh, the compositing supervisor to go in and pick up the shot or hand it off to someone else. So the more organized you can be, the better off you are. Uh, so the vertical tree works out really well in that situation. And another thing that uh, some of us tend to do is color coding of panels. 
So you notice we have a red panel here, and I look throughout the composite here, and there are several red panels. Well, that is all the same element, which was a red flashing light. Okay, so it's a no-brainer. Well, I'll make it red. So I can look at this composite really quick and say, okay, well, that element is probably the same element through the whole comp. Uh, you know, here, the fire, these left passes, the, they were used multiple times because the footages were like 2,000 frames. So if you've got an element that's working and you want to keep a consistency and you have that many frames, use the same one, just use different sections of the, fr of, of the sequence uh, to get the variation so you don't get the repetition. And this actually ended up being pretty long uh, once we were done. I think it was roughly about 300 frames uh, to avoid a lot of recycling. Now, as we um, went through the composite, uh, this particular shot does not have, because this is a pre-comp, a lot of rendered elements. Uh, right now. So you'll notice that for the most part all, all of the elements tend to be on the left side of the tree here. We, we like to keep the, the, the practical shot elements on one side of the tree and any CGI rendered stuff on the other side of the tree. So what you have is when you look at a composite you know if you've got to go find an element you can look at the left hand side kind of scroll down through it and find it or look at the right hand side. Pretty complex uh, composite. There was a lot of stuff involved in there in with it and so we got down to the point where we thought we had something that was pretty close that we wanted to show to the director and say, hey, we think uh, we got a final here. And uh, we, we ran it into a few shots. Uh, you know, you're still seeing some various stuff out here that was actually never visible in the, the angles that we had. Uh, but for the most part, I think, you know, we were kind of, you know, cropped into kind of, I think, about this area here was kind of the active area uh, for the most part. So any of that miscellaneous stuff you were seeing uh, did not show up. And, and there again, we worked really hard to, to eliminate any uh, over, overlapping stuff. And, and you can see some of the, the problems getting distortion down in here, but there again, when this was used, you know, we, we ended up not uh, you know, going down actually lower than that. So why worry about stuff down here that you're never going to see? But you know, we kind of purposely designed the shots to where, you know, where we had our problem areas we'd be able to avoid. So anytime you can do that, uh, you know, it, it's worth, worth your while. Now, um, you know, he, he, he pushed this back and said, you know, guys, it looks great, but it just doesn't seem quite real yet. So, um, you know, what we're, what we're going to do? You know, the, the director says it doesn't look real. You know, that always sends us into a little bit of a, of a think tank discussion, shall I say. Uh, where we go, okay, well, what's wrong with this? What do you see? And so we, we pulled a lot of people in and had a lot of people look at that. Uh, you know, we, we showed it to other effects supervisors uh, and, you know, they weighed in on what was missing. And the feeling was it just hadn't been quite, you know, filmified or we kind of call it the filmification is something like that, turning, turning our digital stuff into something that looks like it's actually captured on, on film. And, you know, how do you go about doing that? It, you know, it's, it's a several processes that you you go through, sometimes we'll actually take the background and we, we kind of jitter the pixels so that we, we end up with, with uh, uh, a pass that is kind of uh, diffused. Uh, it's not blurred, but the pixels are displaced uh, on a fine pattern and then we mix you know, a percentage of that back with the original background and now you have something that is a little less uh, synthetic. It feels like it's got a little bit more of the the characteristics you have when you capture stuff on film. Now, uh, one thing we ended up uh, doing was creating uh, a lot of mats. So we, we did a luminous extraction of the background, so we got the hot areas, but we didn't want to do it to everything. So this is where the artistic side comes in. All of this stacked nodes here are mat after mat after mat after mat after mat after mat put together uh, and then put into basically a color card uh, that had a, a, a a value that was recognizable in the actual plate photography. So once we, you know, got in, this added to it, as I zoom down, you'll start to see what happens here. Suddenly, uh, around the uh, sign here, we're getting blooming that comes over this this chromatic aberration that that everybody hates, you know, in their still photography. Um, I know I do, um, but we, we have to add that in to make it real, uh, to keep it from being synthetic, and it really helps a lot. I mean, initially we applied it to all this up here, and it just didn't look right, and, 
and so we had to go back and rework that. I mean, the other thing you did here, with, uh, you can't see because we ha uh, don't have the running footage, but uh, you know, all of these lights in the background, anything in the distance, we actually ran a noise pattern through. Uh, that was translating up and use that to kind of do an in and out so the light would kind of flicker up and down a little bit. Uh, any night, uh, if you're near a big city, go out and look, especially in the summer if you've got a nice clear night, you'll see the lights are all sitting there dancing. You know, it's a little bit of stuff and, and uh, you know, what is causing that dancing. Of course, it's, it's heat uh, distortion, basically, in the environment. I mean, you're dealing with a, uh, you know, a, a gas uh, between you and that light source, and any any smoke, any uh, pollution, uh, anything uh, that's environmental will affect how the film captures it. So, uh, you know, the other thing we did is we went back uh, as as when we were initially looking at this too. We were looking at uh, reference footage. We we go all the time and look at reference reference uh, videos. So, um, you know, as you go down through this, there's a lot of stuff still added. We did a lot more glows. Um, and, you know, as the shot progressed down, uh, we kept adding more and more stuff. I'm not going to go through this. We added more red lights. We added even more stuff here that wasn't, was put in at the last minute and not cleaned up too well. Because uh, sometimes you just have to get the show out. And here as we build up, you can see how big a change. There again, this here was not visible, so you can kind of ignore what you're seeing up in that area. But but we also did mats and colored areas of it differently because there again in the real world you know when we put this this smoke haze in you know we tried to use some of the background to uh, to illuminate what we were were seeing but it still didn't feel quite right it felt like it was an element it felt too consistent so by coming in and, and creating garbage mats we were actually able to punch holes in it uh, so in areas where it was darker you punched it down a little bit so it didn't haze that out and areas that were brighter maybe you punched it a little bit brighter you know especially down in this area you really get the feeling of well, okay well now that looks okay but this looks so much better because this is what you would see and you notice how how we eat in to the plate here and and blow through stuff you gotta ignore that little mistake <laughs> uh, but uh, that adding that aberration and that stuff you know especially down in this area see that's plate and here's what we added uh, you know it's just replicating what was there or blowing this out and, and you know going to the extreme especially on the Kodak sign back here you know this looks great but this just helped it so much getting that bright intense light and same way in here you 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 basically you're overexposing your film and so you know computer graphics you can't really overexpose it because you're not dealing with it in the same way i mean you you have to think in the film background the, the film you know a film a film process uh in order to replicate it so uh iron man 2 was a great project uh we had a lot of fun with it uh you know we'd love to see a third one we'll see what happens with that and i uh, would love to be involved with that as well but uh, thank you very much for your time.